Today in the Daily Dose, the history of NASA. NASA picks the right stuff. On October 4th, 1957, the USSR scored the first victory of the space race when they successfully launched the world's first artificial satellite into low Earth orbit. In response to Russia's Sputnik launch, the United States formed NASA, which dedicated itself to beating the Soviets in the pursuit of manned spaceflight. In January 1959, NASA began screening the records of 508 military test pilots before choosing 110 candidates. The candidates were arbitrarily split into three groups, but due to an overwhelming volunteer rate, one of the groups was randomly eliminated. After a battery of written tests, interviews, and medical history reviews, 32 candidates traveled to Lovelace Clinic in Albuquerque, New Mexico, where they underwent exhaustive medical and psychological testing. But the group proved to be so fit that only one man was eliminated. The remaining 31 candidates then traveled to Wright Aeromedical Laboratory in Dayton, Ohio, where they underwent the most grueling part of the selection process. For six days and three nights, the men were subjected to various tortures that tested their tolerance to physical and psychological stress, spending hours in freezing pressure chambers that simulated 65,000 feet of altitude, followed by heat chambers that reached temperatures of 130 degrees Fahrenheit. From these 31 candidates, NASA selected seven men who would become known as the Mercury Seven. On April 9, 1959, NASA introduced America's first astronauts to the world, consisting of Scott Carpenter, Gordo Cooper, John Glenn, Gus Grissom, Wally Schirra, Alan Shepard, and Deke Slayton. Ladies and gentlemen, today we are introducing to you and to the world these seven men who have been selected to begin training for orbital space flight. I don't think any of us could really go on with something like this. We didn't have pretty good backing at home, really. Uh, on my wife's attitude toward this has been the same as it has been all along through all my flying, that uh, if it's what I want to do and, and uh, she's behind it and the kids are too, 100%. I have no problems at home. My family's in complete agreement. <laughs> How NASA sold the moon to a skeptical nation. NASA's ability to market manned spaceflight became as essential to American support and funding as the astronauts and equipment that got them there. The eyes of the world now look into space, to the moon, and to the planets beyond. The idea that Americans wanted to go to the moon was so audacious that NASA had to market the excitement and upside of space travel to skeptics in Congress and the population at large, since to land men on the moon would cost 4% of the national budget for a full decade to come. To gain public support for such a bold endeavor, NASA set out to market the moon with everything in its toolbox. The amount of detail NASA provided for each mission was monumental, including an abundance of photographs both on the ground and deep into space. NASA ultimately growing mass interest and support for the space program to a fever pitch by the time Apollo 11 was scheduled to fly. Before the first historic landing on the moon, NASA provided an almost 300-page press kit for journalists, allowing different types of media to pick and choose what they wanted to talk about be it a focus on the spacecraft itself or biographies of the men tucked inside them. How an astronaut went to the bathroom or ate in space was readily shared in every detail, further galvanizing its audience to the wonders of manned spaceflight. NASA also encouraged consumer companies to amplify the excitement. But the astronauts do some things you do. In space, they drank Tang. Tang, chosen for the Gemini astronauts. Have a blast. Have some tang. And 
here's a new way to help keep you in shape for the space age. New Post Count Off, the cereal you can count on. Post Count Off is made with nutritious oats. You can count on it. Public opinion surveys from the 1960s showed that most Americans readily approved of putting men on the moon. However, after the high water moment of Neil Armstrong's first steps on the lunar surface, considered by most to be a victory for human achievement, interest and support began to evaporate rapidly. And when Congress pulled funding for the last three planned Apollo space flights, Apollo 17 would become the last time men successfully set foot on the moon. Alan Shepard, the first American in space. A graduate of the Naval Academy at Annapolis, Alan Shepard saw action in the Navy during World War II, becoming a naval aviator in 1946 and a test pilot in 1950. Selected as one of the original Mercury 7 astronauts in 1959, Shepard proved to be the definition of the right stuff when he piloted his Mercury Redstone 3 rocket into space on May 5, 1961. Before ascending up to the capsule, Shepard paused to admire his massive rocket, later recalling that he suddenly realized he would never see the beast again. Flight delays rolled on for more than four hours until he finally asked for a bathroom break. Denied by the flight director, Shepard was encouraged by ground personnel to simply let it go. He later recalled that he was completely dry by liftoff due to the wicking nature of his cotton undergarments and the capsule's environment of 100% oxygen. Named Freedom 7 by Shepard himself, his 15-minute flight would take him 150 miles up into space where he was able to fully control the pitch, roll, and yaw of his spacecraft. Upon his return to Earth, Shepard became an instant national celebrity, flying into space a mere three weeks after Soviet cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin became the first man in space. Designated as the commander of the first crewed Gemini flight, he was grounded in 1963 due to Meniere's disease, an inner ear condition that causes extreme bouts of dizziness and nausea. After the ailment was surgically corrected in 1969, Shepard commanded Apollo 14, becoming the fifth and oldest man to walk on the moon. One of the crew had smuggled the head of a six iron in one of their utility pockets of their spacesuits, and when Shepard attached the head to a shaft-like piece of the lunar lander, he took four one-handed swings on the moon due to the restrictive nature of his spacesuit. While the record for the longest golf shot on Earth is held by Mike Austin at 515 yards, when Shepard finally connected on his final shot, it is estimated that the ball traveled upwards of one mile, or 1,760 yards, through the moon's reduced gravitational pull. On the moon, anyway, we're going to need a bigger course. John Glenn Born in 1921 Cambridge, Ohio, John Glenn fell in love with aviation at an early age, joining the U.S. Marine Corps during World War II, where he flew 59 Corsair fighter missions in the Pacific theater of war. He later flew 90 missions in an F-9 Panther during the Korean War, shooting down three MiGs in the last nine days of the war. After graduating from the U.S. Naval Test Pilot School in 1954, Glenn flew early test flights of the Voigt F-8 Crusader, entering the record books in 1959 when he made the first supersonic transcontinental flight in three hours and 23 minutes. Selected as one of NASA's Mercury 7 astronauts in the early days of the space race, Glenn served as a backup pilot for Alan Shepard and Gus Grisham who made the first two successful suborbital test flights in the Mercury space program. After weeks of anxious delays, on February 20th, 1962, just 59 years after the Wright brothers' historic first flight, John Glenn became the first American in space when he flew his Friendship 7 space capsule to an altitude of 162 miles above Earth. Splashing down some five hours in three Earth orbits after launch, Glenn's feet made him a national hero that would follow him for the rest of his life. After retiring from NASA, 
Ohio voters elected Glenn to the U.S. Senate in 1974, where he served four terms over 24 years, focusing on such causes as nuclear proliferation, wasteful government spending, and aging. On October 29, 1998, Glenn returned to space on a nine-day mission aboard the space shuttle Discovery, making him the oldest person to ever fly in space. And while his participation aboard the shuttle was deemed a publicity stunt by many of NASA's critics, the 77-year-old participated in numerous experiments that studied the aging body's response to weightlessness. He passed away on December 8, 2016, at the tender age of 95, making the life and achievements of John Glenn one of America's 20th century national treasures. The first men on the moon. After the Apollo 1 launch pad fire that tragically took the lives of Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chaffee, Apollo mission engineers and key flight leaders paused to reassess the risks of a successful manned mission to the moon and back, identifying 13 risk stages and risk reduction controls before launching a single unmanned test flight followed by three manned flights that concluded with Apollo 10's successful orbital flights around the moon. Apollo 11 was to follow, landing two men on the moon in an event that saw the world hold its collective breath during liftoff in a tense lunar landing, followed by a second collective gasp of wonder when Neil Armstrong became the first man to walk on the moon. Launching into an Earth orbit of 114 by 116 miles on July 16, 1969, with Commander Neil Armstrong, Command Module Pilot Michael Collins, and Lunar Module Pilot Edwin Buzz Aldrin, two hours and 44 minutes later, the crew refired their SIVB stage rocket for a five minute burn, successfully placing Apollo 11 into translunar orbit followed by a three-second burn a day later for a planned mid-course correction. Celebrating the first color TV transmission to Earth, on the fourth day of their flight, the Eagle Lunar Landing Vehicle undocked from Columbia for its descent to the lunar surface, changing course at the last minute due to previously unseen obstacles in their intended landing zone, before touching down in the Sea of Tranquility just as the Eagle ran out of fuel. Spending 21 hours and 36 minutes on the lunar surface, Armstrong and Aldrin blasted off the moon on July 21st for a successful redocking with Columbia at 128 hours and three minutes into Apollo 11's flight. After the lunar module was jettisoned four hours later, the command service module achieved trans-Earth injection that same day splashing down in the Pacific Ocean on July 24, 1969, after a flight of 195 hours, 18 minutes and 35 seconds, an achievement that pushed the boundaries of human exploration in space. Now 54 years later, NASA plans to return to the moon as early as 2024, with planned lunar landings in 2025 or 2026 this time with digital rather than analog technology, making Apollo 11 a seminal achievement just 66 years after the Wright brothers' first flight. The Space Shuttle Program. Christened by NASA as the Space Transportation System, or STS, the Space Shuttle project was taken from a 1969 proposed conception for a system of partially reusable low-Earth orbit spacecraft. The first of four orbital test flights occurred in 1981, leading to the first operational flights beginning in 1982. Five Space Shuttle orbiters were built and flown on a total of 135 missions from 1981 to 2011, including two flight failures which resulted in the deaths of 14 astronauts. 
The space shuttle missions launched numerous satellites, interplanetary probes, and the Hubble Space Telescope, as well as the construction and servicing of the International Space Station. The shuttle fleet's total mission time was 1,322 days, 19 hours, 21 minutes, and 23 seconds. The primary components that made shuttle flights a reality included the shuttle itself with three Rocketdyne main engines, a pair of recoverable solid rocket boosters, and the expendable external center tank containing liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. Once its external launch engines were discarded in low Earth orbit, the shuttle relied on its orbital maneuvering system engines to navigate the vacuum of space, as well as to execute its deorbit burn for re-entry into Earth's atmosphere for a landing at Florida's Kennedy Space Center or the Rogers Dry Lake Bed at Edwards Air Force Base in California. If weather conditions required the shuttle to land at Edwards, the orbiter was flown back to Kennedy Space Center on the shuttle carrier aircraft, a specially modified Boeing 747. The first orbiter, Enterprise, was built in 1976 and used exclusively as an approach and landing test vehicle with no orbital capabilities. The four fully operational orbiters were the Columbia, Challenger, Discovery, and Atlantis, of which two were lost to mission accidents. The first was the Challenger on January 28, 1986, when an inexpensive O-ring seal failed at liftoff in the right solid rocket booster, which was not designed to handle the unusually cold conditions that existed at launch time. The breakup cost the lives of seven astronauts. The second was the Columbia disaster of February 1, 2003, when the ship suffered a structural failure upon re-entry into Earth's atmosphere. Seven more astronauts died when a piece of foam insulation broke off the shuttle's external tank during liftoff, damaging the left wing of the orbiter. Upon re-entry, the damaged left wing heat shield allowed hot atmospheric gases to penetrate and compromise the left wing's internal structure, causing the craft to break apart upon re-entry. A fifth operational orbiter, the Endeavour, was built in 1991 to replace the Challenger. The last men on the moon. The eyes of the world now look into space to the moon and to the planets beyond. After John F. Kennedy's now famous Let's Go to the Moon speech, one fifth of humanity watched Neil Armstrong walk on the lunar surface. But after multiple Apollo flights would follow Armstrong's achievement, the world, along with American politicians engaged in an expensive war in Southeast Asia, seemed to lose interest in the technological wonders of putting men on the moon and returning them safely back to Earth. When budget cuts came down from Washington, NASA was forced to cancel its last three missions, making Apollo 17 the last time men would walk on the moon. The 12-day mission in December of 1972 included Commander Gene Cernan, Module Pilot Jack Smith, and Command Module Pilot Ronald Evans and while the crew has been written up in history books and acknowledged by the space and scientific communities, none have received the public recognition they so rightly deserved. Apollo 17 broke multiple records, including three days on the lunar surface, with moonwalks lasting up to eight hours at a crack. After landing in the Taurus Littro Valley, they deployed scientific instruments while collecting a treasure trove of lunar samples for scientists to study back on Earth. Apollo 17 was the first mission to have no one on board who had been a test pilot and also marked the first night launch in U.S. human spaceflight history. While the three unused Apollo spacecraft were later repurposed in the Skylab and Apollo Soyuz program, Apollo 17 marked the last launch of a Saturn V rocket. Now that Americans have a growing interest in returning to the moon before conquering a landing on Mars, a hearty salute to the nearly 400,000 men and women who made the Apollo moon landings a high water mark in human achievement. And there you have it, the history of NASA, today in the Daily Dose. 
Today's Daily Dose documentary is brought to you by Platospeech.com, a lesson planning tool leveraging content like this and much more for educators and homeschooling parents. Check out the description for more information so that you too can teach something new every day.